And greetings everyone. Welcome to my uh, continued series on themes of the 20th century. Uh, today's lecture is intended to kind of set you up for an understanding of what ideas um, fueled this new government in 1917, the Soviet Union. Too often, I think, when we look at the Soviet Union and the history of the Soviet Union, we have kind of a vague sense of what communism means, but uh, I do believe that really trying to get a sense of the thinking of Soviet behavior uh, is really very much guided and rooted in these ideas. So what I want to do today is break it down by introducing you to the basic ideas and tenets of Marxism and then we're going to go a step further and talk about what exactly Lenin did with Marxism. How did he modify it? What did he add to it? Because the term Leninism, of course, is his version of Marxism. Um, just like Maoism, for example, would be Mao Zedong's spin on Marxism. And several leaders in history get their own uh, uh, ism. Stalin, of course, Stalinism, uh, which is one that we associate more certainly with the, the more dark disturbing elements of how Marxism can, can go awry. One of the things I think we need to understand is that Marxism is the primary source of, of, of communist philosophy. When you get additions to Marxism, like Stalinism, Maoism, Leninism, and so on and so forth, you are getting significant alterations to the interpretation of the primary source. Now, of course, Mao and Lenin and Stalin would all be in agreement of the basic principles of Marxism, um, but a lot of the interpretations and a lot of the way in which these ideas were implemented in these countries is going to be determined by cultural factors, um, to what degree is the society developed or underdeveloped, um, there will be ideological biases, and so on and so forth. So when we look at the long history of communism in the 20th century, we have to go back and understand that all the Marxists that came after Lenin, in most cases, were or referred to themselves as Leninists. For example, Mao Zedong was a devout Leninist because um, Lenin brought in a revolution in an agrarian country, which is the complete opposite of what Marx would expect. So it's amazing now, here we are in well into the 21st century now, and Marxism, Leninism, the Soviet Union seem so incredibly irrelevant now. Uh, in fact, the graduating students uh, in uh, the high school where I teach um, were all born well after, 10-15 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So for young people today, when we talk about the history of the Soviet Union, it is equally as remote and as distant to them as Nazi Germany or, or um, Indochina or, or ancient Rome, you name it. It's somewhere back there. It doesn't really hold a lot of meaning to them. They're interested in these topics, but for those of us who grew up during the Cold War and remember the specter of communism and the fear of nuclear annihilation, and, and uh, I vividly remember watching the May Day parades in Moscow and being overwhelmed with, you know, the, the arsenal and the red flags and the broad sweeping portraits of Lenin and Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx, of course, they're much better looking in this portrait than they were in real life. Uh, they really made their uh, features very strong and bold. Uh, so it can be very, very daunting looking at these kinds of images. Um, so anyway, if you are interested in this topic and you want to study uh, Soviet Russia and the history of Russia, this is really, I think, a very important place to start in order to get you in the mindset of understanding what the Soviet Union was all about. Um, uh, because these were the guiding principles that led them along the way. So, all right, uh, let's move on. So, no better place to start than with Karl himself. 
He was born in a place called Trier of a German and Jewish family. Uh, he grew up during a time of great industrial expansion in Germany. You have to consider that Karl Marx is a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution. That was the age in which he reflected on. That was the age that inspired him to ask the question, what on earth, uh, how do we protect these, these new workers? Because remember, the working class, as it was, was very much a byproduct of the industrial age. And all this happened very, very rapidly. And by the second industrial revolution, the one I think that most of us are most, most uh, uh, familiar with, rather, the one in the middle to late 19th century, uh, we see an incredibly rapid uh, growth in steel industries, in railway building, in the proleta proletarianization, to use a Marxist term, of labor. So keep that in mind that he's watching all these cities grow, all these people move into the cities, working in factories, working long hours, suffering from health um, issues as a result of the the nature of the jobs they do, ingesting particles and, and all kinds of things. So there's a lot to be concerned about when looking at um, the plight of working people in Europe in the middle 19th century. In addition, keep in mind that Great Britain and France were really the leaders in terms of uh, the acceleration of industrial um, uh, uh, movement forward, if you will, and uh, you know, others would catch up, France of course would and everybody else, but they were really the two that, that industrialized very, very quickly. So, uh, The industrial working class grew and property was being gathered into relatively few hands, you know, sounds like a cliche, but essentially what happens is, you know, you get, you get people who had left the countryside you know, you give you an example of it, say a young man's living in, you know, with his family on a farm. He says, hey, mom and dad, there's this, these new opportunities in, in, in Paris, you know, these factories. I get to see the city. I get to be around a lot of people. It's all very exciting. Um, you know, and sometimes whole families would, would move into the cities, uh, not just, you know, children, uh, who, who, you know, young adults, rather, who would be interested in ex experiencing uh, a big city. But families would move in uh, to Paris or Berlin, what have you, and, uh, and uh, once you, you know, once you left the area that you were leaving, for example, if you were, if you were um, a landless peasant or you were uh, someone living on a farm that was owned by somebody else, the moment you leave, that, that farm is going to be filled by somebody else. So you can't just go to the city and say, geez, I don't like this, I'm going to go back. Um, but what you see happening is this mass migration of people, individuals, families, you name it, going into the centers to um, take up these new opportunities. And of course what they faced was a whole new set of rules. You know, you have to work so many hours a day. You're going to get paid this much. There's going to be relatively punitive penalties for um, being late or whatever it may be. And the work, of course, was repetitive and boring <clears throat> and harmful to your health. So, you know, there was a, a lot of reason for uh, people to be upset with the conditions as they were, for certain. Marx's writings, like the Communist Manifesto of 1848, I would argue this is the one that had probably the biggest influence because it was a relatively short essay, if you will, and could be read relatively quickly. Das Kapital is a little bit more academic, um, but still very important in the, in the history of Marxism. And they would become very, very strong social statements. Basically what Marx did is he wrote down what he saw, he, he articulated very well what the problem was, and he offered a solution. And I'll, I'm going to go into those details, uh, and I don't mean to be, you know, uh, slim on, on details right now, but we are going to go through that. So. You have to consider that most people, certainly industrial workers, could not read. And oftentimes what would happen is if there was someone in the factory, for example, who could read, and maybe he read um, uh, the Communist Manifesto, he'd be all fired up. Wow, this is incredible. He totally understands where we're coming from. 
he might invite his comrades in the factory to join him at lunch and says, look, I, I want to read this to you. This is amazing. And you can only imagine that if you're a worker, you know, slumming it out 10 hours a day in terrible conditions and you're depressed and unhealthy and everything else and being treated poorly, um, the Communist Manifesto would be an incredible lift and because it would offer solutions. It would offer a recognition of the conditions in which you live and it would also offer a solution. Okay? Socialist and Communist parties would spring up throughout Europe, each with their own spin on Marx. What we see happening is that within intellectual circles, um, people would begin to have great debates and discussions about Marx's writings. And now you're seeing in the middle to late 19th century, political parties forming that claim to represent uh, the intended goal of what Marxism had to offer. So, Marx saw history as a history of economic stages, from, from primitive communism, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, and socialism. Okay, this is very important. So, what Marx does is he claims, and I would say rightfully, a lot of what he says is correct. I mean, uh, the, the, the social problems that Marx identifies in Europe are correct. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, but then we get in debates about what the solution is. But I think he was very good at identifying not only what was happening, but giving historical circumstances to come to an understanding of how we got to this place of industrialization and exploitation of the workers. He argued that in primitive times, societies functioned communally. You know, they gathered, they shared, they worked together, they hunted together, um, they looked after the families together. There would be warring amongst tribes, of course, but within each primal, primitive community, rather, there was a tendency to share the resources and work together. So, in primitive communism, what Marx says is that in our most basic nature, there were tendencies to share and to look after each other. But then slavery comes along, and you see a situation where strong individuals are now hurting and taking control of other individuals for their own purposes. Feudalism becomes another system of taking advantage of groups of people, exploitation, the manorial lord um, who has maybe peasants living on his property who, who pay taxes or, or do work on the farm or whatever it may be. Either way, you have a very few controlling the destiny of, of, of very many. Capitalism, of course, when you get into the part of, of, of money and, 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 and transaction and exploitation, you know, that capitalism for him was like the highest stage of, one of the highest stages of exploitation because in a factory situation, when you've got a factory owner, say hypothetically who owns the factory, he might have 500 employees working underneath him um, who are being paid only a fraction of what they produce and therefore the factory owner is living in the lap of luxury, making a killing, smoking Cuban cigars, drinking fine brandy, and sitting in his leather chair enjoying the wealth. So um, each stage though, when you begin with slavery, uh, is about exploitation. And then out of these generations of historical exploitation, Ideally, you would end up with socialism when the workers take over the means of production and they distribute things equally and fairly. That's the basic idea here. Passage from one stage to the next, that is of these five stages, um, uh, results from a conflict between a class controlling the means of production, the factory owner, and the one or group of people that it exploits, the worker, right? Or the manorial lord and the peasant, the slave owner and the slave, right? These historical sort of processes of exploitation. Marx saw the worker, who was the creator of value, being exploited. And he talked about the notion of surplus value. Surplus value is very important to understand in the history of Marxist interpretation because it gave an economic explanation of what was wrong. Let me give you a basic mini lesson on surplus value. 
So if you're working in a factory, let's say you're working with 100 people, you are producing, oh gosh, cheeseburgers. Let's use cheeseburger as a metaphor. Um, you are producing 10 cheeseburgers an hour, okay? And when those cheeseburgers are put to market, they are, they are producing 50 cents an hour of profit. That is after the expense of the factory owner purchasing the bread and the ground beef and the cheese. He's purchased that, yes. And then you're making the burgers and the patties and you're wrapping them up and frying them, putting them in packages and sending them out to market. So for every burger that that um, worker produces, 50 cents is being made. Profit for the, in, for the employer. So if you're producing 10 burgers an hour, you, pr you are producing $5 an hour of profit. But you're getting paid 50 cents an hour. So therefore, you're getting 50 cents of, of the profit, and the man who owns the means of production is getting $4.50. Now, if you multiply that by the 100 factor, by, that's one individual per worker. You multiply that by the number of workers in the factory, of course, then the profits go through the roof. So essentially, the employer makes 95% of the labor that you're producing, and you're only taking 10%, okay? So you can see the injustice of this. Some people would say, well, you don't have to work there. Well, the, 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 the factory owner gave you a job, and, he, um, and he, he, he paid for everything that you're making anyway, so you shouldn't complain. Um, not an unreasonable argument either, but if you were a worker mucking it out, and you have this explanation that, hey, wait a second, my labor, my work, that is, has value, and my value is being taken advantage of, and this is how it is being taken advantage of. It wouldn't take rocket science for a worker to figure out that he is producing a tremendous amount of profit for his employer and only getting a very small uh, part of the spoils, if you will. So the idea of surplus value is a very important part of this narrative. All right. Well, revolutions, Marx predicted, would occur first in advanced capitalist countries because the working class would have significant numbers. Okay, let's go a little bit further. So Marx believed that what was going to happen was once workers had this ideological epiphany of their plight, they were told that, well, look, you know, you're only getting 10% of the profits per hour, and the, you know, if, if, if the workers in this factory take over the factory it would be the majority of people overthrowing one person or a small group of people. Once that process occurs, hypothetically, uh, everything that is produced and all the profits accumulated by the things that factory is producing is then spread out equally. Okay, So if you're producing ten dollars an hour and everybody's producing ten dollars an hour, say in profit, then that's what you're going to get. You know, you're going to get an equal share of what it is that you produce. And what does that do for worker productivity? Well, it raises it through the roof because then they know that their work has value, they know they're being treated respectfully, and they know that they have a vested interest not only in the company but in their livelihood and that the fact that the harder they work, the more they're going to get paid, um, hypothetically. But you're still going to distribute everything equally. So, on so many levels, you can see how this kind of thinking would have great appeal. Um, when factory, in fact, upon factory, ideally all the major factories would, would make this transition, and then uh, governments would then also have to be overthrown. And this is where things get murky, because the thing is, Marx identified the problems in Europe, he suggested a solution, but he gave no sort of direction on how you're going to manage society once the revolution occurs. Um, at least not thoroughly. And I think that's why there was so much disarray after many Marxist revolutions, and a lot of them got really toxic and 
problematic and, uh, and quite brutal uh, because there really wasn't anything in place to determine how things are going to be organized once the revolution occurs. But the thinking would be is that if Paris, Berlin, London had revolutions, that's where they would happen in the most highly industrialized part of, of European society. They would be led by communist, communists, class conscious workers and intellectuals. You need later, Lenin would refer to the vanguard of the proletariat. You need leadership. You can't just have revolution people running in all directions with pitchforks and torches uh, with, with no game plan. I mean, it's all fine and good to overthrow something that you don't like, but if you don't have a direction as to where you want to go, you're going to have chaos. And that's what Marx didn't want to happen. Marx believed that such revolutions would be violent because the ruling capitalists would not yield their wealth and power voluntarily. Well, that's pretty obvious. Uh, but that they would be democratic insofar as the vast oppressed majority would dispossess a tiny minority of exploiters. So, you know, people who may not have been historically violent could find cause that this was completely justified. That yes, it might be a little bit ugly, but at least I'm on the side of the masses. I'm on the side of the majority. So therefore, in that regard, it could be deemed as democratic and equal because um, for this very reason, the majority overthrowing the minority. Once capitalists were ousted, a transitional period would occur referred to as the dictatorship of the proletariat. Once again, the idea that there might be a temporary period where there would have to be strong arm tactics to keep down the capitalists and keep down the exploiters and either lock them up or throw them out of the country, whatever it is that you do. Um, there needed to be a period of dictatorship and unfortunately Many of the communist experiments of the 20th century never escaped from the dictatorship of the proletariat phase. And in fact, um, government became heavily entrenched in people's lives in, in, in Marxist-inspired societies of the 20th century. Um, workers of the world would unite and cast off the chains of oppression everywhere. Ah, this is where Marx harks back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau who made similar proclamations and was probably one of the more left-wing of the enlightened thinkers, of the French enlightened thinkers uh, who would uh, inspire the French Revolution. Of course, you know, Marx looked to the French Revolution and, and he looked to the writers and the enlightened thinkers like Voltaire, and Rousseau, Montesquieu, Diderot and many others, uh, but you know, he believed that the French Revolution didn't go far enough. They, they were on the right track, but you know, you needed now with the industrial age, uh, you have the workers are the majority in society. So they were the ones who were going to lead the way. You know, but this kind of thing could be pretty inspirational. A worker state would run the government and distribute goods fairly to the people and educate them in socialist values. So we're going to basically train people to think like a good socialist, to behave like a good socialist. We're all going to hold hands, sing Kumbaya by the campfire and everything's going to be distributed equally. Holy mackerel. You know, you can imagine how powerful this kind of language would be to the disenfranchised of Europe. So, uh, once the intended purpose had been achieved, the state would wither away. This is where I think either Marx was trying to find a way of wrapping up his writings. He had enough of what he had to say and all right, well, and at the end of this, the state's just going to go away. Okay, well, that sounds great, but what does that mean? The state, won't, you won't need a state because everyone's going to be working in harmony and there will be no more conflict because everyone's going to cooperate and ensure that things are distributed equally and collaborate and there will be no infighting. And I mean, I hate to sound sarcastic, but I mean, the idea of the state withering away is pretty idealistic and not realistic. And what we found in the 20th century is completely contrary to the state withering away, the state became the center point of managing the economy. And, uh, and that becomes the real problem of the more uh, rigid and totalitarian nature that many communist societies uh, endured during the 20th century. And, uh, you know, so. You have to keep in mind, too, that, that each communist country
uh, we're guided by those cultural factors as well. So you can't really uh, compare Ho Chi Minh's uh, Vietnam with uh, Mao's China or Mao's China with Fidel Castro's Cuba. You know, some were more rigid than others, i.e. Stalin's Russia, North Korea, and some were more uh, less rigid. Certainly Fidel Castro's Cuba stands out to me as one of the less um, brutal uh, of, the, of the communist experiences in the 20th century and of course in the 21st century as well because Cuba continues to be a communist state. All right, so now you get the spin. You got the primary source, Marxism. Now people are going to begin to interpret it, adjust it, formulate it to their own needs and so on and so forth. Marxists after Marx have tended to tailorize their ideas to their own needs and prejudices. You know, Lenin did it, Mao did it, Ho Chi Minh did it, Fidel Castro, all of them, right? They, they, they took that source and they had to make accommodations to some degree. In the most industrialized societies where the middle classes were expanding though, Marxism began to lose its relevance. Now by the late 19th century, the specter of communism was not quite as daunting because we see a tremendous growth in the middle class, the bourgeoisie, the upper middle class, the lower middle class, and the middle middle class. Um, they become a really large demographic and they're really the ones that are moving and shaping societies. So um, while the working classes were still of course significant, um, the middle classes were uh, that were also expanding were not terribly interested in, in Marxism. They, they were hard-working uh, individuals, usually white-collar workers or doctors and lawyers and teachers, people who worked hard, who did services for the community, who got paid fairly well, who could afford a home and raise a family and so forth. They're not really the demographic that are going to be terribly interested in Marxism. Ironically, the first major Marxist-inspired revolution would occur in the least industrial society in Europe, in Russia. I mean, Marx didn't even talk about, you know, rural societies. I mean, he talked about the idiocy of rural life, so he had a pretty condescending attitude towards peasantry and agrarian elements of society. I mean, for him, it was always the working class, the industrialized centers, right? So here's Russia, you know, and nobody would have ever thought, and China as well, you know, these are societies that were roughly 80, and 90, 80 or 90 percent uh, peasant-based when communist leaders took over. So, Also in all the revolutions inspired by Marxism, the state has played a dominant role in the reorganization of society, but nowhere is there any sign that the state had withered away. The state became entrenched in people's lives. China, of course, today even. so. Of all the Marxists, though, who would have an impact on the 20th century, it would be Lenin who would not only transform Russia, but many of the major political events of the 20th century. There is no question that of all the interpreters of Marx, it would be Lenin that would have the most pervasive and dominant influence on Marxist theory in the 20th century. And as I said earlier, all the third world Marxists, whether it be Ho Chi Minh, Fidel Castro, or Mao Zedong, would refer to themselves as devote Leninists. So they, they saw through his lens, through an agrarian society, a similar set of circumstances as their own. One thing I need to mention before we move on. One of the great contributions that Marxism has to Western democratic societies is that it forced Western European countries to humanize uh, their policies. So, for example, uh, in, in Germany, we could use Bismarck as an example. Bismarck despised the power of the Social Democratic Party. You've got to con con consider, too, that communist parties were morphing into, you know, uh, democratically inclined parties or, or not necessarily revolutionary. Yes, there were revolutionary parties, but a lot of Marxists began to turn towards more constitutional um, ways of, of, of implementing change in society. 
So that's where you get social democracy really is born out of a, a softer, gentler version of Marxism. But what ends up happening is that in the case, I'll use Germany as an example, someone like Bismarck said, well, geez, you know, we're not going to sit around and wait for the revolutionaries to take over. We're going to actually give working people things that will make their lives better. An old age pension, a, min a minimum wage, uh, workers' compensation if they're disabled, subsidized housing, whatever it may be, that what the threat of communism does is it humanizes Western democracies to implement policies that make people's lives better. Because it's a lot better for the state to make those decisions than to sit around and wait for a revolution. So the, I would argue that that is the, the, the long-lasting positive contribution of Marxism and socialist philosophy is the humanization, you know, those qualities that forces Western governments to introduce. So, all right, well, there he is. Uh, full name Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov Lenin. You can see he was relatively young when he passed away. Uh, only seven years after the Russian Revolution, you've seen these imagery, very chiseled features, and these pictures, you know. He looks very strong and intelligent. Here is Lenin with a cape. Here is Lenin with books and library. And you must have Lenin smiling with children. So, you know, all the, all the uh, dictatorships of the world love to show off their many sides. So there he is. So he grew up in a comfortable middle class background and had been well educated. He graduated from law. St. Petersburg University. He was no slouch, well-educated, well-read, um, and very early on in his life, very, very uh, compelled by Marxist writings. Uh, when Lenin was 17, his brother was hung for his part in an attempt to assassinate Tsar Alexander III. I mean, here he was at 17, just about to enter uh, law school, and his brother is now killed for an attempted assassination of the Tsar. You can only imagine the impact that would have on him as a young man, you know. And in many ways I would say that it was the execution of his brother that really fueled his anger and frustration with the Tsarist government at the time. He became a disciple, for lack of a better term, of Marx and would end up in Siberia for three years because of his views and activities. I mean, much of his adult life was spent coming and going, fleeing, uh, coming back and fleeing and coming back. I mean, he spent time in London. He was in Brussels. He was in Switzerland during the first Bolshevik Revolution, or no, the first revolution of 1917. Um, the second one was the Bolshevik Revolution. But, you know, he was constantly, uh, you know, coming and going. He left Russia in 1900 and settled in Germany, later living for a time in Brussels, Paris, and London. You know, there he is soaking up all the intellectual Marxist um, uh, opinions and discussions that are occurring and you know it's interesting that a lot of the European Marxists kind of looked at uh, Lenin as a bit of a rough around the edges kind of a guy uh, and they also maybe didn't respect him as much as he felt they should because he was coming from a place uh, Russia that is that in their view was not even remotely close to being uh, fit for a Marxist revolution but you know he was going to make this happen in 1903, when the Russian Social Democrats split into two groups, you know, you have the Mensheviks are the more moderate wing, and the Bolsheviks are the militant. They both believe in the same thing, but they're both now taking two paths of achieving the goal. Lenin became leader of the more militant radical group, the Bolsheviks. So that's what the Bolsheviks were. The stage was set for the rise of Lenin's Bolsheviks. So. All right. Well, here's a perfect example of a may, some kind of May Day parade, probably I would assume in Moscow or, or East Berlin or one of the other Eastern European countries. These kinds of massive banners, you know, uh, they're pretty pretty colorful, pretty pretty. Uh, you know, I remember as a young man just being quite enamored with the scope of their their um, parades. So. So the term Marxism-Leninism is often ref used in reference to the history of the USSR. Lenin insisted on a tightly knit body of dedicated professional revolutionaries 
with clear lines of command and military discipline. Okay, the vanguard of the proletariat. What Lenin said is that you can't sit around and wait for a revolution to happen. They're peasants, you know. There have been peasant rebellions, but nothing ever came up of them. They usually were suppressed and brutally shut down. Mark, Lenin was basically saying is that you need to push for the revolution and guide it. So this is a top-down, not a grassroots situation. I mean, you need to feel the waters and make sure that there's enough anger and resentment at, 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 at the government at the time. But really, this is a revolution that needs to be guided. It cannot be a French Revolution kind of a situation. Chaos in the streets, bread riots. It has to be directed. He also recognized the peasantry as a key to any Russian revolution, a clear departure from Marx's view of working class revolution, who had talked discouragingly, I said yeah, earlier, of the idiocy of rural life. Marxism was focused on the urban working class itself as the vanguard of the revolution. For Marx, socialism is possible only in fully industrialized countries, right? That's what Marx said. Lenin, no. Lenin would have to justify how a communist party can seize and control power in a society which was over 80% peasant-based. The organization of this peasant-based revolution would require a vanguard party, another clear departure from Marx. That is, as I said, you needed that top-down organization. Um, of highly trained and skilled intellectuals and revolutionaries. Uh, Marx says that the capitalist stage is crucial, but Lenin says it can be skipped and continued by the party. Okay, you know, the huge departure here, because Marx was all about industrialization. It was always about that society needed to be highly, highly developed. And then it's just a matter of simply workers taking over the factories. Everything's in place. The means of production are in place. The factory's in place. Everything's organized. And now it's just a flip of who takes control of things. Uh, Lenin is saying that, well, we're going to skip the capitalist stage because we're far away from that. We will, the vanguard will then organize the capitalist stage. So the capitalist stage is going to be happening from the top down, not from the ground up, not from the grassroots. In other words, the Vanguard Party will be responsible for educating the illiterate masses and organizing the post-revolutionary period. Okay, this is where you can see a bit of a problem, because Marx is basically saying that these few tightly knit revolutionaries are going to be responsible for controlling everything. Education. Well, if it's going to be an education by the few who are feeding it to the masses, that doesn't sound very egalitarian. That doesn't sound very equal. I mean, for Lenin, his ideas were all about equality, but you can see how this kind of a structure would be more, would, would allow and lay the template for a very, very rigid, top-down, totalitarian type of system. That for Lenin, it had to be that way. Maybe they don't know what's good for them, but it is good for them, and that's how we're going to do it. Right? So, all right, well, like Marx, Lenin wrote extensively. I mean, my gosh, if you ever get the chance or you have the desire to work your way through uh, Lenin's works, they are, it's an extensive body of work. And you have to be pretty um, really interested in the fine details of economic theory and political theory and, and, and Marxist theory. And I mean, it's, it's tough to get through for sure. Um, but there's no question that, that, you know, he really, really understood and interpreted Marxism in a way that, you know, he worked very, very hard to find the justification to make it relevant in a peasant-based society. And perhaps of one of his largest contributions to Marxist historiography, historiography means the history of history, um, was his work titled Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Like Das Kapital, or rather like the Communist Manifesto, this was a relatively brief and digestible, digestible explanation of how and why capitalism and imperialism is corrupt and what you can do about it.
And I, to me, of all the things that he's written, this is probably my favorite work because I think it still holds a great degree of relevance, I think, in the 21st century. And I'll explain that once we go through this. Published in 1917, he tried to bring Marxism up to date to account for such recent developments as intense colonial rivalry, international crises, and finally the First World War. So he was writing this hot on the heels of the outbreak of the war. He'd had a, a, a fully clear understanding of, of what imperialism was, how it worked, uh, why it was, what was wrong with it. And uh, so it's very, very interesting. Thus, instead of the original Marxist vision of the victorious socialist revolution as the simple expropriation of a few factory owners, Lenin described the dying stage of capitalism as an age of gigantic conflicts related, relating it effectively to the 20th century. So in other words, he argued that capitalism had reached the bottom of the barrel when they felt the necessity to, that is, the colonial powers, Britain, France, and even Germany to some degree in the later part of in the imperial era, um, that they felt the need that the only way that they can sustain wealth in their economy is to go overseas and control underdeveloped nations and third world nations, exploit them brutally, and enrich themselves by taking advantage of people all over the world. So what, Mark, what Lenin recognizes is that colonialism and imperialism is like a life support system for the capitalist economies of Western Europe. Now, the best way then to destabilize that life support system is to encourage revolutionary thought in the, in the, in the colonized countries, right? Which is why later people like Ho Chi Minh and many other African Marxists would, would see that and say, yeah, we're, we're colonized, we're exploited. If we take control of our economy, then we break free from the yoke of imperialism and we destabilize the mother country as well. So it really had its logic. Lenin wanted to ally the proletariat of Europe with the multitudes of the colonized peoples. We are brothers. Workers in, in Paris and Berlin are brothers of peasants in Vietnam. I mean, we're all in this together, right? So um, we need to work together to, uh, we're one big family. So making that link between the industrial working class and also the, um, uh, the, um, the peasants of, uh, of Europe, I mean, the peasants of, of the third world, is a direct link to the unity of communist theory. Whoop. Um, he concluded that in its ultimate form, capitalism becomes imperialism. So, at the end of the day, um, you know, that it doesn't get any more bankrupt than that. That once capitalism moves towards imperialism, that is the, that is the most shameful and the bottom, the end of the line for capitalism. Because you can't get sink any lower than exploiting uh, the multitudes of colonized people all over the world. Um, he saw colonialism as a life support system for Western European democracies, which I talked about earlier, and that's absolutely correct. That there's no question that that is the case. Uh, Lenin, in establishing a socialist revolution, would seek to encourage revolutions in the third world where he believed uh, would lead to the collapse of the West because of their dependency on the colonies. So you destabilize the colonial network, you in effect have a domino effect that destabilizes the capitalist economies and the imperialist economies of Britain and France, where revolutions were, will occur, right? So you need to make conditions terrible in those places, and then it spins from there. Lenin saw surplus capital invested overseas for expansion, so he's given this broad sweeping explanation that not only has great appeal to intellectuals in Europe, but will continue to have emergent uh, appeal to intellectuals in the colonies. So that's, I think, where Lenin's explanation has such a pervasive impact on the Third World. Lenin was clearly charting his own path to Marxist theory, no question about it. So that sets us up for where 
where the Soviet Union was coming from. Now keep in mind, when we get to the Russian Revolution of 1917, there were two in 1917, one in March, one in November. It's the November one that is the Bolshevik Revolution, but what we know now about the Russian Revolution, and I'll talk about this when we get to that topic, is that it was a, it was a coup d'etat. You know, most people in Russia didn't even know a revolution happened. It, it, you know, it starts in St. Petersburg with the Bolsheviks taking over, you know, the Winter Palace or taking over the police stations and the armaments and so forth. And then the revolution spread out from there. So it really comes back to that top down, we are the vanguard, we are the, we are the ones that are going to push this revolution and we're going to manage and control it. So it was very, very, very managed. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from a, an author named Nicholas Ryazovnosky, who's done very, I don't know if he's done, uh, I know he's done a, a version of a history of Russia in the last 15 years, but his uh, Russian history was a staple in the 70s and 80s, and I, even I read it way back when I was quite young. But this is what he says, and I just think it's a wonderful uh, interpretation of um, Marxist, Marxism-Leninism. He says this, it's a pseudoscience, Marxism-Leninism also possesses numerous earmarks of a pseudo-religion. It proclaims itself to be the truth, the ultimate and entirely comprehensive total, the first and the last. It determines in effect the right and wrong and divides the world into white and black. More specifically, it has been suggested that communism has its doctrine of salvation. Its messiah is the proletariat, its paradise is the classless society, its church is the party, and the scriptures are the teachings of Marx, Engels, and Lenin. The class struggle will cease when man attains the just society, when man leaps into the kingdom of necessity, into the kingdom of freedom. It is probably the pseudo-religious aspect of Marxism-Leninism that makes its frequently fanatical disciples determined enemies of Christianity and of every other religion, for no man can serve two gods. So, very, very interesting spin and one that I quite enjoy uh, as an explanation. So, that being said, I think we're going to finish off here. Uh, from here now, when we uh, launch into the Russian Revolution, having this mindset of the way Lenin was thinking and his Bolsheviks, I think will really help you appreciate uh, particularly the policies that the, that the Bolsheviks would implement very early on in their reign and that would continue and of course get a much more uh, difficult and, and, and harsh when Stalin would come to power. So. Anyway, thank you very much for coming, and uh, I appreciate you uh, enjoying the lecture. Hopefully you did enjoy it, and don't hesitate to comment on my YouTube page. Thank you very much.